Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight. A court appearance for an accused mass killer. It didn't look like he had a care in the world, and uh, that was very upsetting for me. As Canada's Muslim community contends with the kind of hate police say led to this. We need to define Islamophobia and enforce the laws. No more thoughts and prayers will be accepted. It, it reminds us yet again, yet again, yet again, that there is a serious problem. Also tonight, Alberta enters stage two, but can the province hit their next vaccination target? First dose demand is slowing. We need everyone to do their part. Plus, as Ontario gets ready to open, the province speeds up second doses in a race against the variant threatening summer. And a rare astronomical treat for anyone who is at the right place at the right time. We come around this corner and boom, there's this perfect lookout. And if you are, we've got you covered. This is The National. In London, Ontario, right now, there is at once a desperate need for healing and a push for answers after police say members of a Muslim family were targeted and killed because of their faith. The violence has shaken people all over this country and added to fear that was already there. Tonight, you'll see new examples of why. But first, we're focusing on the people at the heart of this. A mother, father, grandmother, and 15-year-old girl killed by a single brutal act. Thomas Degler with details of the suspect's court appearance day and how the family is being honored. As hard as this week has been for Sana Gassir, seeing her handmade ribbons appear all over London gives her strength. The purple um, resembles Yumna's favorite color and then the green uh, resembles Islamophobia. We see this and it, it gives us relief that we are being supported. She was close to the family. Yumna Afzal, Madia Salman, Talat Afzal and Salman Afzal all killed Sunday. Their young boy, Fayez, still in hospital. The man accused of attacking them remains in this London jail. He appeared in court virtually. Few pictures have emerged of Nathaniel Veltman and police in Canada don't always release mug shots. But now these court sketches provide a glimpse of what he looks like. At the court appearance, he was practically emotionless as he spoke briefly over Zoom. It didn't look like he had a care in the world and uh, that was very upsetting for me to watch that. As police continue their investigation at Veltman's London apartment, CBC News has been speaking with acquaintances and reviewing court documents that tell of turbulent recent years and signs of aggression. Documents from 2016 related to his parents' divorce say he was prescribed medication and told to attend counseling for obsessive compulsive disorder and depression. His mother stating he'd become so combative and argumentative, I have to lock myself in my bedroom. In his hometown of Strathroy, police say his name appears in 14 incidents from 2016 to 2020. We spoke to a friend of the suspect who says he went fishing with him on this trip just two weeks ago. He says the man has a drinking problem and in recent days lost his grandmother who was supporting him financially. London police say the accused targeted the family because they're Muslim. I can confirm that this is being actively investigated as a terrorist act by the police authorities. He's charged with four counts of first degree murder and one count of attempted murder. So, Thomas, I guess we're hearing from the suspect's family now, too, right? Yeah, the suspect's father is telling the Canadian press this was a senseless act, but uh, that's not the focus tonight here in London, Adrian. It is squarely on the family, uh, the funeral set for Saturday, and uh, events to uh, honour their memory tomorrow, including Friday prayers for uh, Friday prayer services set at the London uh, Muslim Mosque. Uh, they coincide with a lifting of certain COVID restrictions, meaning more people will be allowed inside to pray. And then in the evening, uh, there is an interfaith march that is being planned from the site of the attack all the way to the mosque. Adrian, it is sure to be a poignant moment. All right, Thomas, thank you. This next story has video in it that is offensive. It's hard to watch. We'll only play a short clip, but it's important to talk about because it illustrates the kind of hate many Muslim people regularly experience in this country. Magda Gabrasalasa lays out three separate incidents that have happened in just the last few days. Holy shit, boys. It's an online video striking more fear in the Muslim community. The camera tracks a group of women out for a walk. 
while in the background, a voice calls for a repeat of the London attack. To see that, I have no words to describe like the feelings of it. Saima Sarwar first watched the video while she was visiting the memorial site for the four victims. Police say the man who ran them down was moved by anti-Muslim hate. This video just adds to the pain. It makes you angry, you get shocked, but at the same time, it's like we, we kind of have seen it. We've been seeing it. Hate interrupted this online vigil too. Organizers say people started making racist and Islamophobic comments. Police in Waterloo, Ontario are investigating. It reminds us yet again, yet again, yet again, that there is a serious problem and it needs to be confronted systemically. Mustafa Farouk says after every attack on Muslims, hate is amplified in person and online. If you do see things that are uh, dangerous, that are vile, that call for violence against any human being, please flag it uh, for the authorities. His organization is calling for a national action summit on Islamophobia. So is Saskatoon doctor Hassan Masri. After watching the video, he was left angry and uh, fearful for my uh, for my fellow citizens. We need to define Islamophobia and enforce the laws. No more thoughts and prayers will be accepted. It doesn't end with these two incidents. Ontario Provincial Police are investigating another video in which a man references the London attack during an anti-immigration rant. That video has been flagged and removed. Mark de Gebrasalas, CBC News, Toronto. There has been renewed scrutiny of Quebec's Bill 21 this week, the legislation that bans civil servants from wearing religious symbols at work, a law critics have said unfairly stigmatizes Muslims. Today, the province's premier responded. The Bill 21 has nothing, nothing at all to do with what happened in London, Ontario. Chief political correspondent Rosie Barton and the Ad Issue panel take that on and the calls for political action in the wake of the tragedy. That is coming up in about 20 minutes. Turning now to Canada's battle against COVID-19, a battle that could be entering its final phase. Emphasis on could be. Here's the situation in two simple lines. This is the rolling seven-day average of daily COVID infections in the third wave. From some 8,700 at the mid-April peak to well below 2,000 today. And this is Canada's soaring vaccination rate. 63% have now had at least one shot. One of the highest rates in the world, neck and neck with Israel. Now that success is driving reopening strategies across the country, including Alberta, which entered stage two of its aggressive reopening plan today. People there are now able to sit down and order right off the menu, even catch a movie on the big screen. Aaron Collins went out to gauge the excitement. You can almost smell the anticipation. The curtain rising on the next phase of Alberta's reopening plan. The long wait to catch a flick in a theater is over. Enjoy your movie. You might be the first people to head back to the movies in Canada. Well, but people get out there and <laughs> support the, the theaters. I mean, yeah. these guys have been closed down for a long time. It's not just theaters that are back in business in Alberta today. Most everything from museums to casinos can open with limited capacity. All part of the province's plan to get the economy rolling again. At this bowling alley, excitement at the prospect of opening up the lanes. We've been ready for five or six months, hoping and wishing we could open. So today, getting, the, getting a chance to open is, is just fantastic. But not every place that can open up today is. Libraries in Calgary will open Monday, taking time to make sure they're prepared. Our staff are already busy getting things ready. It's like sprucing up the house for company, um, so we're pretty excited. The National Music Centre will wait even longer to welcome guests back. They plan to open to the public for free on Canada Day, but getting paying customers back in the door is crucial. We're excited, relieved and anxious to get going again because our sector has really been um, negatively affected by the pandemic. 
The province wants all COVID restrictions scrapped by the time the doors open here. But to do that, they say 70% of Albertans 12 and up will have to be vaccinated by next week. And the Premier says uptake is slowing. We need everyone to do their part. So the full opening of our province is in the hands of Albertans, especially those of you who have been maybe a little undecided uh, about getting vaccinated. So, Aaron, while the next stage of reopening clearly still a little uncertain, how eager were Albertans to embrace today's looser restrictions? Adrian, it's certainly not scientific, but by the lines here and the fact that the next movie is completely sold out, I think Albertans are pretty excited to get out of their house and do something, anything. And uh, they can do more than just go to the theater. They can eat in a restaurant today, too. So lots on the menu for Albertans today. Okay, very briefly, what's a movie? It's, it's The Conjuring, a horror movie. So kind of appropriate for the end of a pandemic, I guess. A little escapism, maybe. All right, Aaron Collins in Calgary. Thanks, Aaron. You bet. Ontario is proceeding more cautiously. It is easing into its phase one tomorrow with things like patios and retail stores allowed to reopen at limited capacity. But as Jacqueline Hansen explains, health officials are already moving to contain the next possible threat. <laughs> this is a test ride of Loft Cycle Club's first ever outdoor spin class, and they're going to great lengths to do it. It's almost 16 months of not being able to operate. We're just so excited to be outside and do something. Tomorrow, Ontario opens the door to some outdoor activities for small groups. A cautious step in its reopening plan, as it also tries to get ahead of the latest threat, the more transmissible and potentially more dangerous Delta variant. The variant that hit India so hard is here, and it is on track to be the dominant form of the virus uh, this summer. But we believe we can control it with the right actions. As of Monday, in Delta variant hotspots, people who got a first shot of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines on or before May 9th can sign up to get their second dose. It makes it such that the reopening is likely to be less tumultuous. And the more people we have vaccinated, the more likely we are to, to continue to move forward with those reopening plans. But there are questions from those who got the AstraZeneca vaccine. The government still recommends a 12-week wait between doses. This epidemiologist says the government should rethink that. We need to take a close look at who those people are who are, are having that delay. Because, again, you know, it could be placing essential and frontline workers at, at increased risk as we move into the reopening. This Ottawa bookstore owner is worried the reopening won't last. It just seems to be locked down after lockdown after lockdown. He's eager to see his customers in person again. The website he built to sell his books has been a headache and a huge cost. That has cost me right now over $33,000 uh, to do, and I haven't seen even close to that coming in. Reopening creatively is costly too. I'm just hoping that uh, people show up and it's worth it. <laughs> As the province hopes, the race to vaccinate also pays off. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Looking good. And Manitoba laid out a vision for its reopening plan today. Like Ontario and Alberta, the plan is tied to people rolling up their sleeves. The key to reopening safely and staying open is you getting vaccinated. Not once, but twice. Well, the Premier got his second jab today. Stage one of the reopening plan can begin if these targets are met. 70% of Manitobans, 12 and up, have had at least one dose, and over 25% have had a second dose by Canada Day. In Europe, the World Health Organization is urging caution ahead of the summer holidays. We should all recognize the progress made across most countries in the region. We must also acknowledge that we are by no means out of danger. As Europeans prepare for summer travel, the WHO warns vaccination rates in the region are still too low to protect against another surge, particularly with the rise of the Delta variant. The organization says only about 30% of Europe's population has received a first dose. Strict health protocols were enforced today when Justin Trudeau landed in Britain, his first trip abroad since the pandemic set in over a year ago, and the first G7 meeting in two years. Evan Dyer is following the Prime Minister as pressure grows on Canada to help vaccinate other countries. After two years of enforced separation, these leaders have a lot to talk about. 
The pandemic, of course, not just on the agenda, but affecting every part of this summit held in the country where the Alpha variant first appeared. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will begin every day in England the same way as everyone else at this summit, sticking one of these up his nose and down his throat. He then has to put that in a test kit and wait 30 minutes for a result. If the result is negative, he has to register it with Britain's National Health Service. Only when he gets an email back is he even allowed to leave his room. The leaders of the rich Western nations know they face criticism for monopolizing the world's vaccine supply, and two have already announced major donations. The United States will purchase a half a billion doses of Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine to donate to nearly 100 nations that are in dire need in the fight against this pandemic. That's a historic step. The largest single purchase and donation of COVID-19 vaccines by any single country ever. And the host, Britain's Boris Johnson, today pledged to donate 100 million doses by the end of the year. But what we want from the G7 is an, is an, is an agreement to, to go further. And so we'll be looking uh, to, to, I know that uh, President Biden, I know that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is also very uh, keen on this, as well as Angela Merkel and uh, Emmanuel Macron. The European Union has also announced an additional 100 million doses, bringing the collective pot to 700 million. But the G7 aims to hit around 1 billion doses by the end of the summit. That leaves the G7's other members, including Canada, to make up the other 300 million. Canadian officials say they will have an announcement before this summit ends on Sunday. And even a billion doses won't end the pandemic in a world with 8 billion people, most of whom will need two shots. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Falmouth, England. In Ottawa, MPs on the Ethics Committee released their report on the government's controversial dealings with the WE Group. Canadians deserve a government that will serve them instead of the Liberal elite. So will this corrupt government start putting the interests of Canadians first and implement the recommendations outlined in that report? One recommendation, the committee wants better screening of ministers for conflict of interest ahead of cabinet decisions. Former Finance Minister Bill Morneau was found to have breached the Conflict of Interest Act when he took part in discussion of a possible contract for the WE Group. The Prime Minister was cleared of wrongdoing. Ontario's government is under fire tonight for attempting to make use of a controversial constitutional clause to override a court decision. Ellen Morrow takes us through it. Your deep cuts to health care are making things worse. Third-party political ads like this one are at the center of the dispute. Premier Ford, we ask you, no, we're telling you, please care. Today, for the first time ever, the Ontario government invoking the constitutional notwithstanding clause, overriding a legal judgment that a law passed by Premier Doug Ford's government extending limits on spending for those ads is unconstitutional. The Protecting Elections and Defending Democracy Act Order. will restore responsible guardrails to ensure wealthy elites and special interest groups and corporations won't drown out the voice of individuals. The notwithstanding clause allows governments to go around the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the courts. Ford threatened to invoke it once before in a fight over the size of Toronto City Council. He had an instantaneous reaction to court rulings that went against his political preference. That instance and this instance are in the electoral context. Yeah, Doug Ford, I'm a little pissed, I'm a little pissed. A little pissed, a little miffed. Previously, spending limits for third-party political ads started six months before an election. The Ford government's law extends that to a full year, doubling the time with no big jump in the amount groups can spend. The court struck that down, saying it's too long uh, and the amount is too low. and You just can't restrict people from speaking out on issues and government actions and decisions for a full year before an election campaign begins. The government says their law promotes fairer campaigns. Critics say they're trying to stifle dissent before next year's election, including the former chief of staff to conservative prime minister, um, yeah, Stephen Harper. They're, they're clearly doing because they think it'll, it'll help them, but they shouldn't be. Ontario's legislature will debate over the weekend. With a majority government, the bill is expected to pass on Monday. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. A huge loss tonight for the federal Green Party. One of its star MPs is now a liberal. Again, I never expected this day to come. 
Next, why she decided to defect and where it leaves a party now with just two MPs. As vaccinations rise and cases fall, what happens next? Forgive me if this is a dumb question, but how does it end? It will probably end the way it began. Why the pandemic's finish line may look different from how you expected. And Canadians wake up early for a celestial stunner. We come around this corner and boom, there's this perfect lookout. Taking a moment to watch the ring of fire, we're back into. Former Canadian Forces reservist Patrick Matthews has pleaded guilty to multiple charges in the United States related to his involvement with the neo-Nazi group. The 28-year-old was allegedly acting as a recruiter for the group while living in Manitoba in 2019 before crossing into the U.S. He was arrested in Maryland and accused of illegally entering the country while possessing weapons with the intent to commit a felony. He will be sentenced in October. Victoria's City Council is cancelling its virtual Canada Day event this year. It will instead produce a broadcast guided by First Nations, which will air later this summer. The mayor says the reported discovery of remains at the Kamloops Residential School led to the unanimous vote. The new broadcast will consider, according to the council, what it means to be Canadian. The head of a statue from Toronto's Ryerson University has reappeared in southern Ontario. It now rests on a pike at the site of an ongoing land dispute south of Hamilton. On Sunday, protesters pulled down the statue of Egerton Ryerson. Ryerson is considered one of the architects of Canada's residential school system. Tonight, the federal Green Party caucus is a little bit smaller. An MP crossed the floor today to sit with the government. And as David Cochran shows us, her defection highlights an apparent divide in the Green Party ranks. I, I know that my liberal, uh, Once political uh, rivals, now fellow liberals, I as a bright green light heart. turns red. And the color of my team uh, does not compromise who I am or what I will continue to do for this riding. The green hope was that Jenica Atwin's breakthrough in Fredericton would be the start of something bigger in Atlantic Canada, building on provincial success in New Brunswick and PEI. She joined Elizabeth May and Paul Manley to give the Greens a caucus of three. That's now down to two. Um, again, I never expected this day to come. It came in part because of internal Green Party disagreement over Israel. When party leader Annamie Paul called for a de-escalation of violence between Israel and Hamas, Atwin tweeted the statement was inadequate and wrote, I stand with Palestine. One of Paul's advisors, Noah Zatzman, responded on Facebook, accusing Atwin of appalling anti-Semitism, vowing, we will work to defeat you. It's been really difficult to focus on the important work that needs to be done on behalf of my constituents. Um, so it certainly has played a role. I have never had anything but incredibly positive things to say about her. I was looking forward to campaigning for her in the next election. Paul says she was surprised by the move, doesn't agree with it, but claims Atwin's conversations with the Liberals predate the controversy over Israel. None of those uh, reasons touched upon me and her decision uh, predated, uh, not her decision, but her approach to the Liberals um, pre, uh, uh, well predated uh, the events um, uh, that you mentioned. But Paul's own MP seemed to corroborate Atwin's version of events. Paul Manley and Elizabeth May issued a statement saying they are heartbroken at the loss of their dear colleague and blaming their own leader's advisor for causing this crisis. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. So what could this mean for the future of the Greens? Rosie is next with that issue and later. I'm curious. I'm absolutely curious. Dozens of shoppers, Drug Mart customers, say they were pushed to use the self-checkout. Are we losing the choice of a cashier? This killing was no accident. This was a terrorist attack motivated by hatred in the heart of one of our communities. The Canada we have is one where four of these people are never going home. Our Canada is a place where Muslims aren't safe. 
The political response to the attack in London, Ontario, has been met with questions about whether enough has been done to fight Islamophobia. That has led to renewed scrutiny over past actions, like a 2017 motion calling on the House of Commons to denounce Islamophobia, a motion a majority of Conservative MPs voted against. And Quebec's secularism law, Bill 21, also faced more backlash this week. There is absolutely no relation, no link between Bill 21 and that kind of gestures of hatred. So what should the political response be moving forward? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. And because we left off there with the, the Bloc Québécois, maybe I'll start with you, Chantal. Uh, you know, I, I found Monsieur Blanchette's comments um, curious, maybe eyebrow-raising a little bit, but tell, tell me what you have made of the, the political conversation that's come out of this and and really whether the response um, has been different or, or needs to move forward in any way. Hmm. Um, I thought the political leaders, by and large, had the proper political response. Uh, I, I don't think that one should be doing politics uh, on a tragedy, and it, this is a tragedy. Yeah. I also believe that looking in the mirror matters more than finding diversions to say, it must be somebody else's fault somewhere else. So uh, conversation about uh, Bill 21 is ongoing in Quebec, is ongoing in the courts, but it is a little easy uh, to say, oh, well, let's just make Bill 21 the, the middle of that conversation because I, I think the issue of Islamophobia deserves a larger conversation. For sure. Um, but, but Althea, I, I, and I'm not saying it's to blame, but, but surely it is... It is I, I found what Mr. Blanchet to say, well, it has nothing to do with this, also a little rich, uh, that, it has not, that it doesn't in any way contribute to Islamophobia. I know it's viewed as a secular bill in Quebec, but still... I think we need to take our cues on that from uh, Muslims themselves and yeah. from what I've been hearing watching CBC uh, and reading the news like everybody else on this panel is that it is mostly Muslim groups who are making that link between Bill 21 um, and sentiments, rising sentiments that are Islamophobic. Um, and I think it's up to you know, us to listen to people who are telling us that they feel that they are being discriminated against and that they would like to see their federal leaders act. I also understand that a good part of the Quebec Liberal Caucus, the Federal Liberal Caucus here, believes that uh, the reason they don't have a majority is because in 2019, uh, the Liberals had a certain position on Bill 21 that uh, they believe hurt their chances um, in Quebec. And they would like to see the Prime Minister toe a line that is more uh, Quebec-friendly, Legault-friendly, and that's certainly what we've seen. And in fact, um, from his, from the Prime Minister's early remarks this week, uh, where he said, no, he didn't think Bill 21 contributes or fosters, I should say the, the word was fosters, um, hatred and discrimination, uh, but then went on to make other comments uh, that could be seen as a linking uh, Bill 21 now law um, with Islamophobic statements. Uh, now uh, he seems to have uh, moved the Liberals even closer to the Lego position. Uh, Arif Varani, the parliamentary secretary of the Justice Minister, was defending the bill uh, today in the House of Commons saying, you know, I just want to flag, this is in French, of course, that, you know, the federal government is not a party to uh, the criminal court cases on this, mm -hmm. or the judicial review case on this. So it is an interesting pickle for the Liberals, but in the end, they are pleasing nobody. They're not pleasing uh, Muslims and those who feel like they should be going further, and they're not um, they're not pleasing Quebecers who would like the federal Liberals to butt out. Uh, and Andrew, what what did you make of the, the the response by political leaders, given that that we have been here before? Uh, it's a lot of cheap lip service, I would say. Um, it's a little late in the game. Uh, you know, granted, I don't think you can attach specific blame to specific pieces of legislation for this particular act or specific debates that might have taken place in the past. But at the same time, there's been a lot of dog whistling, but there's also been a lot of acquiescing in dog whistling. So whether or not it's been, you know, I think liberals were trying to attach blame to the conservatives for some of the uh, tiptoeing up to the line or sometimes crossing the line that they've engaged in, in the past. But it's not a whole lot more defensible in the face of a fairly outrageous piece of legislation like Bill 21 to basically run and hide, as all the federal party leaders have done. So this, um, you know, we are in a time in which uh, it is clear that there are segments of the population, on the one hand, who are angry and 
uh, willing, looking about for scapegoats, and there are other sections of the population who feel themselves to be scapegoated, who feel themselves to be under attack, to be isolated, to be without political support, etc. Uh, and it's the job of political leaders um, to lead on this. Uh, la last word to Chantal, then I'm going to change topics. Yep. I do believe that the conversation over Bill 21 in Quebec is not over, but I tend to think that the court's words on the bill and that first court had very harsh words about what the legislation was doing and how it uh, was created will probably have more impact than any politician coming from outside uh, and especially linking it which sounds like a bit of a cop-out for less introspection into what has led to this, which I think Bill 21 may or may not be a part of, depending on where you stand, but it is certainly a larger discussion. Okay, I, I want to get to another piece of uh, rather big political news today as well, very different uh, in nature, so I'm going to change tone here. Green MP Jenica Atwin announced she's crossing the floor to the Liberals. Here's a bit of what she had to say. It's a good day. I think this is um, a positive thing for my community. And I, uh, you know, the past month I've been at a crossroads. Um, it's been, in a word, distracting. Um, and so I'm going where I can do my best work on behalf of my community. The distracting piece seems to have been the divisions around uh, the Green Party's position on the Middle East. Althea, what the heck is happening here? The, the caucus has lost now one third of its uh, members. What, what, what should we make of this? It's a probably politically smart move for her. She may have a, a better time holding the seat as a Liberal. Um, it is not an easy move, though. She is very vocal on certain issues that um, she will find are not shared with many of her Liberal colleagues, notably on the Middle East issue. Yeah. And she could cause her leader, her new leader, Justin Trudeau, a lot of trouble uh, on that very issue because she is certainly not aligned with where uh, Liberal Party policy is on that, um, never mind other things such as, you know, oil pipelines and whatnot. Um, so it's not going to be an easy transition. Uh, she's probably going to be like a Nathaniel Erskine Smith uh, MP. The two of them are pretty close, actually. Um, it's a great day for the Liberals. Um, aside from the, the, the Middle East issue, because uh, they can now look and say, you know, she said in her own press conference that the only option she had was the Liberal Party. There, she did not look at the NDP. Uh, we know that the Liberals are having trouble with young voters, uh, and perhaps uh, they can point to her as saying that uh, those young voters are still welcomed and opposing views are welcomed in the Liberal Party fold. What, what does it say, Andrew, though, about the Green Party and, and the leader who does not have a seat yet? And, and this was, uh, although she wouldn't go there in her press conference, I mean, I, I do think this is a comment on her, her leadership. And, and I'm not sure what it says about it, but it says something. <laughs> Well, I, I find it a bit puzzling, frankly, though, because if there's a foundational belief for the Green Party is that you don't have to agree with your leader, that you don't have to have monolithic caucus solidarity yeah. on them, sure. that it's okay for MPs to disagree, to vote their conscience or to vote as their constituents, and I happen to agree with that. So, uh, so that's puzzle number one. Puzzle number two is if she is interested in speaking her mind freely, I'm not sure the Liberal caucus is really the place to go for that. <laughs> uh, I think she's going to find that uh, that if there's a foundational Liberal belief, it's that you stick with the leader. So uh, it does cause you to wonder what she thinks she's accomplishing by that, other than uh, the obvious that this is maybe enhances her chances of getting reelected. I think the electors of her riding who voted for her uh, to, uh, on the basis of her being a member of the Green Party uh, might have a thing or two to say about that. And ordinarily, I would say she, she should be obliged to run in a by-election. But if, with an election coming up, maybe that, that's the moment to put that to the test. We, we should say that while the Green Party, yes, they allow people to disagree, uh, Annamy Paul's one of her advisors spoke out about um, and sort of seemingly pointed at Jenica Atwin for her position on this. Um, condemning it. So I, I don't know how collaborative it is, really. In, in, in theory, it is. I'm not sure if that's the case. Chantal. I'm going to step back from today's events and say that this was a good day for the NDP, uh, because they don't have to have the trouble of welcoming someone who maybe will not agree with many of their positions. But it does point to uh, a, a weakness uh, of the Green Party that I believe has been baked in since Elizabeth May retired, uh, and that could be a big advantage for the NDP, for instance, in BC, yeah, where yeah. Elizabeth May's sphere of influence was really important, or even in Ontario, 
So up to a point, uh, I think the liberals had a good day, and it is possible once in a while that that makes it an even better day for the NDP. See, that's why I keep you guys around. You get me thinking about things I didn't, I didn't know. The NDP wins the day, or, or sort of wins the day. Okay, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Uh, before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're going to talk about why the Ontario government's introducing the notwithstanding clause and what kind of precedent this sets, if any. Look for it on a, any major podcast app and on our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Now, let's take it back to Adrian in Toronto. All right, Rosie, up next, what happens when the world is finally vaccinated? Forgive me if this is a dumb question, but how does it end? It will probably end the way it began. We'll look at what needs to happen before we get there. But first. He's a piece of our harbor, you know. Haligonians gathered this morning to bid a fond farewell to a waterfront staple. Theodore II, a giant replica of the beloved TV tugboat, has been chugging about the harbor for 21 years. I was there the day they launched them down in La Haye. I was there with my little girls. They aren't little girls anymore. It was legitimately an emotional goodbye for those who grew up with Theodore's big smile. The vessel was flanked by fellow tugboats, as you do, as it left for its new home in Hamilton, Ontario. And now he's getting the chance to get up to the Great Lakes and, and do his work up there. The former tour boat will have a new job, too, promoting sustainability and water conservation. Welcome back. After a slow start, Canada has become a global leader in COVID-19 vaccination. With nearly 63% of the population at least partially vaccinated, Canada is ahead of most other G7 countries in terms of first doses administered and miles ahead of poor nations. In fact, 88% of the global population hasn't even had a single dose. So that is something global health experts say is a problem for everyone. They have warned that COVID will continue to be a threat until the whole world is vaccinated. But how do we get there? And then what? What is the marker of when this is truly over? Rohinton Medora is an economist who runs a think tank about global governance and has been looking hard at what the future might look like. We sat down in a park in Toronto to talk life after COVID. Forgive me if this is a dumb question, but how does it end? It will probably end the way it began. There will be a WHO declaration, which is based on technical indicators as well as of judgments about when enough people around the world don't have the disease but we are unlikely to stamp out COVID-19 the day the WHO has declared the pandemic over. So the pandemic may be over but the virus and the illnesses might linger. I go back to smallpox which despite a globally unprecedented effort to fight took us a good 20 years to eradicate. When you were talking about smallpox and you talked about an unprecedented cooperation. What did that look like? What that looked like was the US and the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War, cooperating on almost every aspect of eradicating the disease. Finding a vaccine, getting it out to the countries where it was needed, cooperating on the policies that we required, including intellectual property, to get it out there and simply not let impediments get in the way. And it still took 20 years. And it still took 20 years. Penicillin, which had been kind of discovered in 1928, its therapeutic uses began becoming apparent towards at the start of World War II. And penicillin production in the US was massively ramped up through a very innovative cooperative arrangement between companies and the US government in which IP played very little role. Why? Because this was seen as doing something collectively to fight a common bad, which was the war. That's the kind of footing we should be on now. You hear countries sometimes talk aspirationally, like Australia, about we're going to get to COVID zero. Does that make any sense? COVID zero in our minds uh, might work. So what really matters is when do you and I feel that it's safe to do everything we used to do before? That would be a judgmental COVID zero. So COVID zero is not about eradicating the virus totally. It's about having a lifestyle that's normal enough for us. 
Is there a point that we get to where there is the same level of infection and death with COVID as there is with the seasonal flu? So, so we perceive it as an acceptable risk or a manageable risk. I suspect that's where we're headed, that we live with manageable risks, that people die from flu every year. Uh, and although we're concerned about it, we don't let that let our lives grind to a halt. We take precautions. There will almost certainly be booster shots for the virus that we will be taking annually for years to come, and we will learn to live with it. But that's not COVID zero. That's living with a COVID that is at an acceptable level. So COVID-19 is not leaving us soon. The G7 leaders will certainly be pushed over the next few days to do more and do it faster. Next on The National. I'm furious. I'm absolutely furious. Dozens of Shoppers Drug Mart customers say they're being pushed to bypass cashiers and just use self-checkout. Why is that? Next. Welcome back. Well, clearly the pandemic has changed shopping. And while online shopping has seen big increases, those heading to stores are seeing more self-checkouts. But one chain's being accused of pushing customers to use them. Diane Buckner shows us. These longtime Shoppers Drug Mart customers are not happy. I'm furious. I'm absolutely furious. All of a sudden, they were like, if you don't have cash, you have to go through self-checkout. The couple are union members who avoid self-checkout in order to support workers and jobs. And they say they had the same experience at another shopper's in the Toronto area. It was the same situation there, a very flustered uh, older lady working the cash register uh, telling people, we're sorry, you, if you don't have cash, we can't take you here. They say that means in order to check out with a person, they have to ignore public health recommendations to use a contactless payment method, such as TAP. And they're not the only ones with complaints. CBC News has heard from dozens of shoppers' customers right across the country, saying they were made to feel they could only use self-checkout. I did go over there because I could see that they're not going to check me out unless I've got cash. In a statement, Shopper's parent company, Loblaw, says customers should always have the option to check out with a cashier, but that the company has seen a significant increase in self-checkout use with no increase in customer concerns or complaints. As for why some customers are now complaining about a lack of choice, no explanation was offered. We'll see how it unfolds. This consumer really behavior analyst know, says once the pandemic really ends, acceptance of self-checkout self could very well decline, as people may become more concerned about preserving jobs and eager to interact with friendly cashiers once again. I have a feeling that that backlash against automation is really going to be evident uh, when we come through to the end of this uh, COVID period. These shoppers' customers say their experience, whether it was policy or not, means they won't be back. I'm not going to spend another penny in shoppers. They say they'll take their business to stores that offer them the service that they want. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Just in case you didn't catch this morning's eclipse, you can get a taste next in our moment. This is early this morning. I confess I completely missed it. I'm fast asleep. But I missed when the sun and moon combined for a few brief minutes to create a dazzling display, a rare annular solar eclipse. So early risers in just a few parts of the world got to experience the celestial sight. And for many, it meant a lot. And tonight, it's our moment. I didn't know exactly if it was, you know, if the, if the sun was going to be on this side or over here, over here, but I knew that this sort of trajectory was going to give me that shot. Now, I've done this several times, this sort of thing, but I've never been this close. So a partial solar eclipse is very cool. You see the sun in a shape that the sun is not supposed to be in. I try to take a few moments to enjoy it. You know, you can see the clockwork of the solar system sort of unfolding right before your eyes. A lookout spot was maybe like, five minute hike or something and the sunrise was just starting to st starting to crack you come around this corner and boom there's this perfect lookout you know, as you like really are seeing like this crescent solar sunrise happen i was wearing like four different four sunglasses because i didn't have proper eye safety wear 
Um, I just really like it was really re refreshing, resetting almost like we're going to get out of this pandemic. We're going to we're going to move forward with life. And it was just super hopeful. And it, it was awesome. <laughs> And Nick says a big shout out to the 10 year old boy who was there before he got there, who had a better map, a better location and had made an eclipse viewer on Zoom class. That is a national for June the 10th. Good night.